अब मास्क कहाँ से आ रही है चेको कहाँ से लांस था तेरी Welcome. Hi. Yeah, hello. How are you doing? Let's just hello. wait. Let's just wait a bit for um, some other people to come to join the call. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Stanley, can you hear me? Okay, so Stanley is here. Um, you can as well start, right? For some reasons, I have to admit, people before. Okay. Stanley, you can start. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. With, like, I don't have statistics of who is around. So, Sorry? I don't have statistics of who is around. So, is everyone ready? Or can everyone hear me? So it's you just have two of your um, students. Oh. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Is everyone on mute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Composure. No, no, no. 
Um, how, how do you share your screen? I have it. Okay. You can see your participants. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, precious is here. Then you can share your screen. For some reason. Just that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Who else is everyone? Uh, high pressures are low. Hi. Yeah. How is how is the self quarantine? Yeah. Um personally I've been indoors, I've no, I don't go anywhere, so I guess it's been going fine. Oh okay, okay. Nice. And I think he's supposed to join us now, but I don't know why he hasn't come yet. I'll just check him. I'm coming. Okay, so can you, um, can you remember or like just give a brief summary of what happened in the last class? Can you? Um, I think the last class, uh, well, the other guy, we went through, uh, we went through more of like a revision of what you did in the last class about um, the I think we did something on perceptron, uh, algorithm, then uh, maximum yes. likelihood. And uh, he also uh, gave us an example of, um, uh, I think a PyTorch, he, he copied a piece of uh, PyTorch code and we went through it together. I think that was all we did. Okay, okay. Uh, but sorry, um, can I ask yours? Yes, I can. Okay, okay. Hi. Good afternoon. Okay. Yes. Okay, I think I'll just like go straight to uh, what we have to do. Yeah. So I'm coming. Um, yeah. Can you see my screen? Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes, okay. we can see your screen. Yes. Okay. So um the notebooks I sent, I don't know if you saw it on the group chat. So it basically just contains what Udacity used in the uh, deep learning and the game. So it's so some part of it which um is part of what I sent is free actually. So you don't need to pay for it and it's quite explanatory. So on your free time you can just go and check it out. So sorry, posted that link to on the group chat yesterday, that last night. Okay, so okay. I, wrote, I wrote a list of what um, we do. So this is what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to like talk about some neural network um, algorithms, some, some things to take note of when training neural network. So there are applications that are important. Then we we'll do uh, okay, it's not from scratch actually. We do both the forward propagation and backward propagation and back propagation rather um, of a neural network using PyTorch. Then we also do training. We also train in neural network and we we'll do an assignment. So that assignment is already part of the the zip file so this sense. I don't know if you saw it. There's this Google Drive link he sent that contains the documents or rather the notebooks that we use. Okay, yeah, I, I saw the link, but um, okay. I'm not sure. I've yeah, you can check it, it out. Yes, yeah. you can check it out. Okay, so this is just basically what we go through. So we go through the neural network in PyTorch, train the neural network. There's this fashion in this. 
that we also work on, then inference and validation. But I think I should use Google Colab instead of using my existing. So I'm coming. So just give me a minute. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm coming. I'm also doing it. So I would prefer if we use Google Colab for it instead of using this. So you exported the uh, Jupyter notebooks to your um, to your drive, then you open it with Colab. Yes, yes, that's your notebook file. You can send it to your Colab and um, to rather your drive, then open it using Google Colab. Yeah. So this okay. is here. We already know how to use this um, Colab, right? Yes, you went through it the last yes, time. So the first thing is like to set the runtime. Okay, it's ready set on GP, so we're fine. So I'll oh, just run it now. Okay, yeah, so we have touch. So as usual, some of the libraries that we need, which includes this um Oh, okay, there's, there's something I have to do. I'm coming. Let me just set it. There is this particular code that is important. That's to connect my, um, what do you call it? Okay, to sell. So, yeah, so what I want to do now is that I want to, mount my drive so I can just read those files directly from my Google Drive. Okay. Okay, so I'm coming. Okay, yeah, so this is it. Yeah. So, what I just did basically is to be able to read um, my drive files or my drive content from Colab here. So, generally, when you go to Colab, it creates this um, directory. So, whenever you um, go off Colab and you reset, so you lose every file there. So, what I just did basically is to make sure that I have, um, I can view all the files in my Google collab in my rather Google Drive directory. So even if I save anything, it's going to save on Google Drive. So that's what I just did. So when I when you run LS, you can then see files already in my in my drive directory, which are all these things. Okay, so what I'm going to just import here. Yeah, so basically what's happening here is just importing the basic things we need. Like numpy, touch, then this helper is the helper function. Designed by Udacity actually. So, so first of all, like there are different things to do when you want to train a neural network using deep learning frameworks. So I'm not really sure how it works in TensorFlow or Keras. 
But the first thing basically that should happen is loading your data set. So for this particular example, we are going to wait just to confirm. Can you see it very well? Like is it clear? Yes, I can see it. I can see your screen. Yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Yes, so, yes, so the first yeah. thing is to okay. The first thing is to load your data set. So there's this thing in Python that is called transforms. So you import it from touch import data sets. This data set here is just so you can load default data sets. So PyTorch comes with image data sets, fashion images, and CIFAR 10. There might be many other data sets that it comes with, but those are just like very little size data sets that one can use as for a beginner thing, basically. So it's just all this um, running through fast training and learning how to use PyTorch. So those are just freely available data sets on the PyTorch platform. So that was why I'm importing here these data sets. And these transforms is what we're going to use to apply um, things like balancing and um, normalizing your data sets. So that's what this transform does. So you also use it when you are loading your data. So the first thing now is to define the transform here. So with this transform, you can first of all convert it to tensor. You know, if you remember in the last last two weeks, we spoke about converting from um, NumPy arrays to tensor data. So basically, if you want to do any form of training on PyTorch, you have to convert it to a tensor, a PyTorch tensor. You understand that, right? Yes. Yeah, so if you have lost anyway, you can just call me back so I don't know. So the first uh, thing is to... Go on. Okay, so this is just the compose. So it takes in a list. So the list you then put in, there are many other things you can add. So you can check the PyTorch documentation. I don't know I should be doing that. But you, you can see other things you can add. You can normalize. I can't remember many other ones you can do. But first of all, the most crucial one and important ones are for you to first convert it to a tensor, which is this line. So after converting it to a tensor, another important thing to do is to normalize. So this normalize, what it does now is that, let's just ignore this. So you know it's a method now. You can see the method here. So what you pass into this normalized method now are what you want to normalize for your you pass in your mean and your standard deviation for the number of channels in the image you are loading. So for this image data set now, it is a one channel data set. You understand what how channels are? I think I mentioned this previously. Do you know what channels are channels? Yeah, color channels. Yes, yes. So something like this now. Um, if you have an image, an image can be two five six by two five six by one. So this means that it's an image with one channel, and you can just conclude that it's a grayscale image. You understand that? Yeah. So yes. you can also have three RGB. That kind of thing. So you, so what what we pass into this place here are the means of each channel, and what we pass into here are the standard deviation of each channel. So since it's just one channel we're dealing with, you just pass in just a single value. So if you use this here, I added it here, I added this part here. So the image data set is normalized by giving the mean one up to the number of channels mean n and standard division to S1 okay. to Sn. Yes, so it's quite explanatory. When I'm just going to go through everything, then you can just check it out, and it's quite simple. So this is how it works here. So it's just the, the actual value, or the actual pixel minus the mean over the standard division. That's just the normalization formula, which is this here. So it's just the actual value minus mean divided by standard division. That's what's just happening there. So now we've defined our transform. So our transform is just a, a function, sort of, but it's a variable. So I've defined our transforms. So the next thing I want to do is to load our data set. So since we're using PyTorch default data set, you can just do data set.mnist, then specify where you want to save it, then download, you set download to true. Since your training set, you set it to true, and then apply your transforms. 
Okay, so is okay. there any way we can confirm the uh, color channel of our data set so that we know the type of transformation to use when you're doing, when you're doing the only way we can know, uh, do you say how we can know the, do you say how we can know the channel, the number of channels? The, yeah, yes, yes, the number of color channels for a data set. Okay, I'm coming, sorry. Someone, um, someone is asking for the link to this. Um, I think Sadiq mentioned this is should be it. Probably. No. Okay. You can send this. Okay. Um, you know what happened? Sorry. Oh, shit. Um, okay, when is asking for the link, right? I will just share this one, this particular one. <laughs> okay, so you guys ask him. Um, please use the share, share, um, share link at the top right here, top right. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, what am I going to do? Yes, yeah, so this is it here. No, you don't do that, share, share, top right here. Yeah. My meal. Thanks. Mm. I don't even have this here, the meal. Let's see. Let's see. This is it. Yeah, that is it. Okay. Okay, so, I mean, you're asking how can we know the channel, right? Yes. Okay, okay, so. How, so, one thing is that, you remember we spoke about sheep? So whatever the value is dot ship. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, with open CV, with open CV, you can open an image and immediately see the shape. Let me show you an example. So um I don't know if there's any image here. Okay, so there are images in this place here. So you can try it out. So then, um, Let me see. Okay, wow, this is taking quite a lot of time. This particular one. I think it's to download faster. Maybe you should use the test data sets instead of train. That should be faster. That's like the entire one. Okay, okay. Okay. That's... Like just set train to false. Like train is false. So that would Okay. Okay, but I'll come back to that. So, again, so yeah, this is... Like, yeah, can you see this? Yeah. yeah. And so this shows us that this is an image of size 375 by 499 by 3. So we can see that obviously this has three channels. Do you get? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's how you can check it. Let me try this. Hmm? Okay. Uh, let me see. Well, this seems like this is faster.
Anfang. Oh. Der kommt von mir aus. Anfang. Ah. Is it him? We are almost the same size. Oh, maybe. Are you? Sorry. I already made it. What do you think? Someone found on this video. I found out your video. Okay. Oh, okay. Why is this thing still downloading? Let me just go through all the things again. So, so now for this part now, so since I'm not going to be doing the whole training or the full training, okay, no, 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 yeah, we are, we are not doing this. So this, this part now could download the data set. This part now, so we're going to download from Python's um, default data set, which is the init one. So once this gets downloaded, we have our data set in this train set. So the next thing to do is to put it in a data loader. So the way Python's data loader is designed is that your data set is split and is stated into batches. So here you don't specify the batch size. So specifying it as 64 means that it will load 64 images per batch. So if you have a like certain number of images, it will split it. And so it's more like, let's say if you have a thousand, it is split into 64. So you then have a, load, um, a loaded data set, something like this. So it's going to be 64 by the total size. Let me just use this guys here. So this would be your new dimension, something like this. So for each batch now, in your data loader, you have 64 images of this specification or this dimension. So there's this technique, and there's this reason why they do it, so that um, I think it's because of yeah, stochastic, um, stochastic gradient descent. I think that's one. That's why it's applicable. So the whole point is so that you can have different starting points and shuffle your images. So that's why they use this particular technique. So you don't have to train on the whole data set in Gitlin. So if you have quite a very really large number of um, images in your data set, you won't have to train through each of them at, the same, at a particular point in time. So you can split it and train for different batches as it keeps shuffling, that kind of thing. So that's what this data loader helps us do. So it helps us break our data set into batches. So this is taking too much time to load. But Someone say something. Okay. So, to so then load those images that we said, just to load a particular batch from the image, we use this function, this data function. So, when you pass our data loader into this, it stores a particular image batch in this data data variable that's created. So, you know, that for us to then get all the images and labels for that particular batch. You then do data eta dot next. So it returns to variables, which are the images inside and the labels. I'm supposed to run this for us to see exactly what it looks like, but this thing is taking so much time for us to load. And I don't know why. Okay, so I'll just explain it then. When that is done, we'll go through it. So that's what this does. So when we print our images or chip, we should see this exact batch size, which is 64, then the shape of the images. Then for the labels, so basically we should just expect 64 by one. So since we just have a single label and there are 64 images. So that's what that one, that's what it does. So since I already ran this code before, this is just looking at a single image from data set. So, yeah, so just to do a, Feed forward um, example, which is what we already know how to do, even though we didn't use it images as of that time. So since we're working with images, we should know what this function should do. 
Can anyone like just guess what was happening here? Remember, I have already spoke about these view functions. So, hello. Sorry. Hello. Is there anybody here? Yeah, um, I want to confirm. If you have any question, you can always send me a message on Zoom. So, like, I can state, state it out to everyone, then probably say the answer. So, if you have any question, just okay. send me a message. Yeah, okay. So, if you don't understand can, can, anything. Can you remember what to use this view function for? That was from last two classes. Yeah, um, hello. Okay, hello. Yeah, the the view function is just um, it allows us to reshape the um the array, you know, the two dimensional array that we have. Uh, it's similar to mp dot uh, reshape using uh, numpy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. So for images now, remember we mentioned that the image shape is sixty four by whatever the width is by whatever the height is by the number of channels. So this now, images.shape zero. So this is just a simpler way of getting the first um, index of the image shape. So it, the first index is going to be the batch size. So since we're using 64, it means you are just specifying that 164 in that place as the first dimension. Then specifying this minus one then means we most likely we'll just want to multiply the remaining part of the dimension to make it suited. So if you have 64 and the other parts were like 28 by 28, that's the width is 28, the height is 28, and probably the channel is one. So it means you want to multiply every other thing together. So it gives you like 784. So that's the flattening part of it. We have to flatten our image. So that's what this does. Then um, I think this is okay, okay. So now, remember we have to use random weights. We already spoke about that. So you can use touch.runs to generate weights of, um, okay, I think I should write what we want to achieve, how we want to move. So imagine we have the, um, how we want to do it is I want to create a neural network that's to have initial, um, initial input nodes to be 784. This way, 28 by 28 image. So that should be the first one. That should be the first um, input neurons, the number of um, input neurons in the first node. Then the next node, which is the first hidden layer, should have 256. And then the final one, if things are classifying 10 um, items, which is the numbers from 0 to 9, so it will be 10. So that's what we want to get. So in order to build the neural network to go through each of these stages where we just have three, um, um, is it three nodes? Yeah, three nodes in our neural network. So the first one is the input node, the second one is the hidden layer, and the last one is the output layer. So based on the whole um, matrix rules we used, if you, if you have an input of this and you want our next hidden layer's input to be 256, what should be the dimension of our width? Can anyone tell us? This is something we've done before, so we should go to this. This is the one that I'll show you. Hello, is anybody here? <laughs> Hello. Hello? Okay, okay, I'll just I'll just go straight to it. So based on the whole matrix thing we explained before, so in order to achieve this now, so the um we have to make sure that the number of columns in the first one should be equal to the number of rows in order to multiply by. So it means we want to have a width. We, have, we want to have width with dimension seven eight four by our next output. It should be this two five six here. Yeah. So if you look at it here, um, if you look at it here, so this is here. So we are creating a new width for the first input layer with 
number of rows 784 and 256 are the output. So with the same thing here, we can use that same mathematics here to get our output. So since we want our number of rows in what in the input should be equal to the number of right, the number of columns in the input should be equal to the number of rows in the next one we're applying, which is the width. So it should be 256 by 10. So this is what you already know. So it's, it's the same thing we see applicable here. Okay. But this time around, we're going to just be, we're just going to be fixing it into variables. Sorry, let me just check if this has downloaded 60. Wow. So um, yeah, back to what I was saying. So we can just create. So we can just um, create our W1 as this, which already specified here. Then our bias, as we all know, our bias should just be a um, single dimension as a vector, which is 256. Then our second weight should be of this dimension, and our bias should be 10. So, so this makes sense. So we have our weight and uh, our weight one and bias one for the first layer, our weight and bias two, that's our weight two and bias two for the second node, and then our output. So we can then get, um, I wish I could draw this thing here. That's how it's transitioning through the whole node thing. But H contains our, um, H is just going to be the output of our visual control for the first layer. So if you can see it, it's just going to flow the normal um, neural network formula, which you all know, which is Wx plus B. So we'll spend our input by the width and adding our bias. So that's for the first layer. Then for now the output layer is just going to be, um, H is going to be our new input and our weight too. Then we'll add our bias. So that's just basically what's happening here. But this is just you're trying to do it from scratch where it's going to be much more easier when you're working with a framework. So, Okay, so I'll just go straight to building it directly with PyTorch. So with PyTorch, there are two ways of creating your network, your module network. You can use this um, Pythonic class method, or you can use a sequential, there is any end of sequential. We'll still go through that one soon. We're just going to start with this one. So up to now, do you understand what I've been saying? Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, I'm following. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks. So, so while we are not going to go through all those stresses that we went through initially, so what we're going to do now is just that we're going to be passing our variables. So at this point, what we need to know is to understand how um, neural networks work, what we want to receive as outputs, as our inputs rather, and what we want to get in our in, um, layers, and then finally our outputs. So with Python generally, how you create classes are like this. You define the, the right class and the class name. So this is what we're passing. This is an inverse PyTorch function, which is an end of module. So we import, you imported it here. Then you define your init class, which is compulsory in Python. So all these ones are things that are Pythonic. So it doesn't really have anything to do with it the neural network itself. So this is just how you create a class in Python. So now to then do exactly what we did here. Remember how we did it here from scratch was that we have to specify our W1, specify our B1, specify our W2, specify our B2, and then multiply them using um, this specify our activation function. Remember we wrote an activation function here. So Something, something. Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I just came in, so I don't know if probably you can just retreat from the beginning because I I don't have access to the previous uh, sorry previous um discussion. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, okay, actually, you know, you've done much like that, but let me just do a brief summary of what you've done. So, basically, what just happened here is us importing 
high touch initially. Import touch, import no buy, import max plus for plotting things. Then there's this helper function. So it's also part of what is in the um, folder that we received. Then here is where we build our data sets. So first of all, where you're busy in your network, or rather not just being in your network, when you want to um, train a neural network for a particular project, you first need to import your data set. You could, you could decide to design your model first, but just following it in the appropriate way, you have to do your data set. So this touch your transform, this PyTorch function transforms. So what it helps us do is to apply different types of transforms to our data set. So if you're working with images or any other thing, you have to convert this to a tensor, a PyTorch tensor. So those are variables that we can use, we can apply many of those unique framework functions such as um, gradient, um, access to the um, GPU usage and all. So you have to convert it to a tensor. Then normalize is basically just normalizing your data set. So you pass your normalization factors. So these are just variables for you will be passing the ones for your mean and for your um, standard deviation. So it, it, you can just read it here. So I explained the how it works. This normalized function, I explained how it works here. So you can just check it here. Then the next thing that happens is you um, load in your data set. So Python by default comes. I hope this is finished downloading. Sorry. By default, PyTorch comes with um, some free data sets, things like the Imnis data set, CIFAR 10 data set, Fashion Imnis, and all. So, this is a function for you to use to load it. So, it's ready in here. Then, after loading your data set, I also said you have to pass it into a PyTorch data loader. So, what the data loader helps us do is that it helps us load our data set in batches, not fully. So, it helps us train better and shuffle our data sets. It makes training time faster and even more efficient. So instead of loading a full data set, you have about a thousand um, images in a data set. It should load those that same 1,000 images, but this time around in batches of 64. So that's just it. Sorry, I think I want to load this because I didn't know why. Happening. So. Thank you, Stanley. So, yeah. so. Sixteen. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So what I said was that we are still downloading data set that we use for this particular method. Then, um, okay. I'll still come back to this later. So what I explained here is just the basic thing that we already know how um, we load our data set in our networks which is us specifying the width of our input. So if you have an um, if you have a data set with image dimension 250 m, 28 by 28, 28 by 28. So we can equally call this 784. That's just converting to a single dimension. So that's multiplying 28 by 28. You have 784. So this function here is what we already discussed about. So what this helps us do now is that after loading this data set, okay, I think that this is done already. Ha. Ah. It is weird. Okay, what is done then? So, I said, when we look at that image, we'll have a ship like this. We'll have a 64 by, 28 by 28 by 1. So this is how our dimension is going to be. So if you print image of chip, you should have something like this. So where 64 is the batch size that we specified initially, then 28 by 28 is the image width and height, then 1 is the channel. So when we then pass it into this image of view, specifying image of chip 0 means we want to pass in 64 to this place. Then every other thing will share this remaining dimension, so which is just everything here. So we we'll have 64 times 784 here. So we we'll have something like this. So now we have our input node. 
to be um, our first our first layer, our input layer, to have neurons of 784. Well, this is just the number of images we have. So using matrices, this would be our rules and this would be our columns. Then if you want the next output, what you plan on doing was that we want to have um, three layers where we have 784 as our input layer, 66, as um, the dimension of our um, hidden layer and 10. So mind you that even though I didn't write it, so it is 64 by 784, 64 by 266, and 64 by 10. So where this is just a number of images, but basically what we're going to be manipulating is the number of nodes or neurons. So if you notice what this, what this just tried to explain to us is that it gets its features automatically and reduces it. So that's an importance of neural network. So um, I already explained that if you want to achieve this, all we need to do is to multiply it by a weight of um, number of rows, 784, and number of columns, 256. So if you do this, definitely you get a shape of 64 by 256. And then if you have a weight two, W2 to, to be this, you have this definitely. So that's just what happened in this place here. Then um, for the first output, um, that's the output of our first layer and first width, we have H. So it is just it, applying WX plus B. So when you apply this here, that's exactly what is this. Then most time by our activation function. Um, so I'll just call it activation. So when you multiply, you get this for our H1. Then this will be our next input, which is this here. Then from here, we can get our output next. So that's just it. Okay. Ah. So, okay, so basically that's where we stopped. So what I'm now saying now is that instead of us doing those things manually, with the help of the framework itself, we can just define the how the mathematics should work or how the variables should change. So this time around, we won't need to be multiplying anything by any other thing, that kind of thing. So this is a Python, this, this is how you declare classes in Python. So after um, creating a class in Python, you declare your init, which is your, um, I think your constructor, but your default, um, yeah, this is your constructor in Python. So, we, so NN is a Python function that we used to create our network. So it has different functions. So this time around, we're just going to be dealing with linear first of all. Um, yeah, one, one, one more thing. Um, super dot init is like here it um, so you're inheriting everything in any Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So now what you just need to pass now in a, in an in end linear function is into, yeah. that, I think it, oh Is there something? <laughs> okay, so what I said is this n dot linear. What it takes in now is your input, um, the number of input nodes or neurons rather, the number of input neurons and what you want as the output. So basically, it already handles the whole weight thing, both the weight initialization. Remember, we were doing our own weight initialization here by creating random variables. So. I thought already create this um, initial width for us in an efficient manner. So what we need to pass in is our input and our output. So that's for the first um, layer. Then if you have multiple layers, so we can have another one now. So this one is now 256 and our output here will be 10. So this is just you doing exactly what we spoke about here in this place. So you don't need to call this function or any other thing. So this, this basically helps you. So you could even do more if you want. You could, you could break it down into, into something like this. Let me say 500, rather 500, then 500, 
this. So you can just specify it. You could enlarge it. You could increase the number of layers. And I think that works too. So you can increase the number of layers. It will still work. Then now, also, NN contains the same sigmoid function that we created and even softmax too. So there are still other activation functions like ReLU, continuous ReLU activation function. So for this case, we're going to be using the sigmoid and then softmax for our output. So um, this is just me creating the function self.sigmoid equals to this, then self.softmax too. So these are just initializing our variables. Then now the actual function where um, which is the for propagation function is this. So you pass in your input images. So your input images is an X variable. So now we then pass X into our hidden function. So when you pass X into it, it applies this same thing we've defined to the image that we said. So you pass this particular image, we apply this. So if you take in the image, it should it must it's composite that the image um, dimension when flattened should be exactly this. So the initial one should just be the part size, which isn't really necessary. So it could be 32, it could be 64. But the point is that it should must, it must be your part size. Um, it must be your part size by exactly 784, because we already specified it here. So we should be sure we're saying that your the number of columns in your input should be 784 and you want the next one which is your output should be 7 and 500 so that's what we're saying here so it must be 784 so that's for the first one then we already spoke about this so after passing it here we'll apply our sigmoid function to it so we'll call the sigmoid function pass x into the sigmoid Sorry, function. okay i can hear you um, you were, but I thought you said earlier, like the bat size is meant to be 64. Oh, I, I think it's not compulsory. Remember back, back there in the loading, the data loading here. So, oh, okay. this is why I specified my bat size. So, you could use any amount of bat size. You can even use two. Two means it's load two images per batch. But the whole point is that it's complete, it's not the total number of data sets you have. So you could use 128, you could use 64, you could use 16. But well, it's best to use part size in the multiples of two. Yes, there are powers of two actually, not multiples of two. The best is one of the powers of two. So, so uh, yeah, so this is what I was saying. So when you flatten your image, when you flatten your image, your image should be exactly like this. It should look something like this. S64 is the number of images that we have for that particular batch and then the dimension, the flatten dimension. So, which is what we pass into this place. So that's just what I'm explaining here. So even though I'm using X here, so you first pass it into the first, seed, the first layer, which is an input layer, yeah? You pass it into it, then apply the sequence function to it. Okay, I think I should call this one. Sorry, Stanley. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> must we use must we use uh, right, must we use what? Ah, <laughs> uh, I got some TK. But you can you can change your question as it takes function to activation. Okay, I I just got I, I just you know what did you say? So most we use two activation functions like instead of using sigmoid and softmax, can we use sigmoid all through? Um, you know this softmax now. I'm, I'm using softmax only for the output. And for the so output, you can you use sigmoid as well for the output? No, we can't. You know, remember I told you the difference between sigmoid and softmax. So, what sigmoid does is that sigmoid just tells you um, what they call it. If if you have like two two um, 
classes now. Classes. So for each class, if you have if for each class now, Sigma just tells you it probably still it being either one or zero. That's ranging yeah. from zero to one. So that's what it does basically. But it's not killed. So softmax, okay. what softmax does now is that softmax kills all your predictions or rather all your classes. So if you have um, from class zero to nine, which is the class you are working with, number of classes in this particular immunity data set is nine. So what Sigmoid, what softmax rather is going to help us do is that it's going to give us the probability of each of those classes with respect to one. So all of them should sum up to one. We're just getting the probability of each of them. Okay. Yeah, so the thing is that if you use softmax while still building the network, let's just say within the input load and um, one of those hidden layers, rather, within the input layer and hidden layers, if you use softmax there, it should affect um, our, our model, like tell me, it will affect it. So it won't give us, it won't give us um, what to use to do back propagation. It won't give us what the error looks like, that kind of thing. Okay, okay. Uh, so, softmax is just best to use at the output. Anyway. So, that's basically what's happening here. So, if you have multiple inputs, something like this now, although I'm not saying that something like this. So, we should be using things like Zigmoid at this point, but not softmax, we are the output. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, I think that is very sensitive. So swap max is for the classification itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, let me check how far this has gone. Even though this is really taking a lot of time. So um so if we print this thing now, we'll have an idea of what our model should look like. So this is just going to be our Real network itself. This class is created as a real network class. So, okay, this is just explanation. So, when you print your model, you see something like this. So, this just gives us a summary of what our model looks like. So, we have our linear, so it's going to take in an image of 784 and give an output of 256. Then, the next layer, which is our first hidden layer and only hidden layer. We take in 256 and output 10. Then we apply, um, okay, we can apply the point after this first one for, for this one. Yeah, yeah, um, after the first, okay, only after the first one. So, um, we apply the Zigmoid function after this first hidden layer, then soft max at the end. So that's just the summary of it. So, another way we can use it now, another way we can do is to use on that touch.nn.functional. So, what this helps us do is that we can just pass our sigmoid function within the fault propagation um, function here. So, if you remember in this initial one, any of them works actually. In this one, we defined our nn function here. Then we're just passing all of them sequentially here. While in this part here, we just use this f dot sigmoid function and then pass our hidden layer. So it's basically the same thing actually. And if you if you check out, you just realize that they are doing the same thing, but it's just different approach of, or different method of doing it. So this one is f dot sigmoid. You pass in our hidden layer here. So this is the same one that we already spoke about. Initially, we're going to do it. We're going to pass this first then after getting this we put it in a variable like x then we then pass x again inside sigmoid or this time around you can just pass everything within the sigmoid and it's going to give you the same thing so maybe in your free time you can just check it out and see that they are trying the same thing so here so um i don't know where i should have explained something so okay at this point now they start using relu you could use sigmoid function but the reason why they start using relu is the fact that 
there's this problem that they call vanishing gradient descent. So what can you see, what that does now, vanishing gradient descent, what it does is that during back propagation, generally, if you apply something like the sigmoid function, so remember that sigmoid ranges from zero to one. So definitely, even if you pass high impedance values, it should squash it down to zero or one. That's within zero and one. So when you're finding derivatives of such for the back propagation purpose, it's because the gradient to the approaching zero. So if you have like a very large network, let's just say you have about, let's say 15 or 15 um, hidden layers such. So as you keep back propagating down to the beginning, the derivative values to keep becoming smaller and smaller. So it will be reduced exponentially. And when you get zero, so imagine when the gradient gets to zero, it will make, um, it will affect our gradient descent um, algorithm. So you almost not be learning anything. So that's what they call that gradient, um, vanishing gradient descent, where the gradient values approach zero and it affects um, sigmoid functions specifically. So that's why if you are working with very little, um, very, very, and um, very little real network, let's just say about three nodes or four nodes, you might not really see the effect when working with sigmoid because your derivatives will obviously not get to zero. But when you're working with large networks, it begins to affect and mess up this network. So that's why they use um, stuff like ReLU, you can see ReLU here, or TANS. But in most cases, and um, based on experiments and tests, ReLU performs very well, even better than sigmoid. So it's best to use ReLU instead of sigmoid. So ReLU is a function already in PyTorch. So the same way we imported ReLU and sigmoid here. Um, that self the sigmoid on okay that was nn um here so the same way there was f dot sigmoid we can just call the value function too so it's still the same procedure after doing our linear um multiplication which is that much more which that's what happens here we then apply activation function this time around the activation function is ready so that's it here then like I said, PyTorch helps us initialize our width and bias. So we don't try to need to do it by ourselves. So they're already um, better ways. So I think it's a more um, efficient way. They already initialize it for us. So we don't need to do any initialization. So this is just like a test for it that they're trying to explain here. Then you can customize this to add your own. So this one just means you fill it into zeros. So we up up to now. Does anyone have any question or any confusion? Yeah, I, I want to make a statement. Is that fine? Yeah, sure. So like, Relu is really good, but currently I think there is one that is even better. It's called Switch. Um, S W I S H. It is by Google. It is X multiplied by sigmoid. So it cancels out the vanishing gradient issue. So you guys should look it up. Okay. All right, yeah. thanks. Okay, so now where we stopped is that we've been able to create a network. So this is what our network looks like. So our network takes in um, image of input shape 784, and then our output should be 10. So 10 for the 10 classes, zero to nine. So now what they're going to do the forward propagation now, which is here. So like I said, train loader contains images from our data set in batches. So when you specify this, you are calling our, you want to load, in this case it's 64, because I specified that batch size 64. We have, we have been bringing out 64 images from our data loader, which I'm going to iterate through. Okay, yeah, so that's the switch function. So, so data um, is now is going to contain our images. So, um, passing images and labels. So rather, sorry, this data it uh, returns two variables. So one is our uh, um, images and our labels. So when that thing is done, I will try and run it so we we'll see the shape exactly. So you see that we have 64 by um, 64 by 28 by 28 by one. So that is the image. Dimension and the other dimensions should be it should just be 64 by one. 
So now we've loaded six, four images that we want to pass into our network. So that's what happens here. So first things first, like I've always said, we need to um, flatten our images. Remember, our network only take our network only take images, um, only take images with two dimensions, which is the batch size and then the shape of the image itself. So we have to use either that view function that we all know about, or we can use resize. So basically, this resize function is just going to multiply the 28 by 28. So we just have um, 64 and 781. So now we flattened our image here. So after flattening it, what um, what this did, what this um, particular code does is that if you remember, the name of our network is called model. So this is it here. Model is goes to this particular network. So model dot forward then means we want to pass in our images into a particular network. So what this does now here is that it takes all the rows of the first um, images, right? The all the rows, all the columns of the first image. So we we'll just have a single image and all the neurons to so that 784. And if this part confuses you, you can just let me start. I'll explain it again if it does. So, but what this code does is that if you have images with 64 as the batch size. It's just going to take a single image out of it. That's what this code does. It just takes a single image and passes it into our model. So at the output, our output will be the predictions. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is just going to be the logic, which is here. Remember, we're giving a softmax output. So the output of our network would be um, of dimension 10. So it's more like the probabilities of each of these classes. That's what that does. So this would just be the probabilities, this PS. So that's the output of our network. So we we'll pass a single image and then get the probability. So then we can just explain what the output is like, or what's the probability for each of those classes. So you can see there are nine, there are 10 classes rather from zero to nine with probabilities this. So we can just obviously see that these are just random probabilities at the initial stage, because we don't start doing any backup partition. So that's just what's there. Okay, I think this should have downloaded already. Okay, yeah, so it's done. Let me just explain, so. And yeah, so this is what I was saying. So these are training loader now. Then if you print our image type, is a tensor that's because we specified that we wanted to have we wanted to convert this to a tensor here that's why you have a tensor image then the image size if you can see it here so it's 64 because that's the batch size you specified then one by 28 by 28 and then the size of the label two is 64 by one that's what you can call it okay so this um, okay. This is um, the one we're doing from scratch. So you can just see how it was switching. So this is when we apply the view function to convert it from this to this. Then after multiplying it, our H is this. This is the shape of our H. That's our first hidden um, layer. And then our final output, which is 64 by 10. So we're just going that. Then here, yeah, okay. I'll just call this part here. So this is our model here. So like I was saying, if I added more values, let's just say I don't use this method. I want to add one more. Oh, no, no, no. So you can you can also increase it. So I'll call this hidden one, cell dot hidden one. Then sell the thing soon. 500. So, so this will be 500. We don't want to so. so now this is just me adding more layers to our neural network. But the whole point is that this should follow this sequence. 
the first input and output, then the output becomes input of the next one, and then the output, and this output becomes input of the next one. Then since this is our final one, we want to output 10. So if you run it now, you yeah, so if I do a model summary now here, so you notice the change. So this is what our new model looks like. So um Yeah, so I want to ask something. Let me just call this 260. Okay. Let me go. Network. I'm coming. What are we supposed to do? This? Okay. Do you really understand this particular error? Can anyone just try and huh? like just explain what you think this error is? Is it over here? Uh, hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so I think the um, number of rows in the second matrix is not the same as the number of columns in the first one. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's why we have, that's why we have that, uh, that runtime error because in the first one, we have one by 784. And in the second one, we have 754 by 500. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's, I think, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, okay. You tried, actually, you tried. But if you notice, there was this point. Okay, that was what I was trying to talk about, but it's just that we didn't test it initially. So, what you're just trying to say is that we are receiving, um, we are receiving an image of dimension one. So, if you remember here, let me just explain this part again, even though I said it before. So here, what we did was that we loaded our image through our train loader. So if you print the shape of this, let me just, um, let me run this separately. Let me run this before initially. So, dot shape. Okay, so if you run this now, we can see that this is our input image. Then at this point, we resize it here. We resize it to 64 by 1 by 784. Then here now, this, if you look at this, um, at this point here, I'm coming. Sorry. I also want to run everything outside here, so I will say this then. And it's going to be straight. Okay. Images. Okay. Yeah, can you see this now? This um, one by seven eight four. That's exactly what we're talking about here. One by seven eight four. So, what this code does now is that we already know how this one works. So this is to six four by two eight four and seven eight four. Then now this just means we are taking a single image from that particular batch. So when you take a single image from that particular batch, it just means the dimension will be one by seven eight four. So now we have an input image now, and we want to pass it into our model here. So this is our model network here. So they were passing this as our input, which is X now. So earlier, I don't know, maybe nobody saw me, but probably some people saw still, yeah. But I changed it from 784 to 754, yeah. So what this means is that when you pass your input, which was that one by 784, it should be something like this. 
1.784. Yeah, so this is what our input is. So when we pass this, this will be our x, our x dimensions. Then you pass it into the hidden layer, which is this. This hidden layer is expecting 78, um, rather 754, but this time around is 7784, which is already the conflict. That is, that's why it can't work. So in, whenever we're building it, we have to specify the exact dimension of the image we are receiving. So that's what I also just to clarify here. So we have to specify the no, exact one, which is 784, else it won't work. Okay, so if I correct that now and come back around it here. Um, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, so this will just be our so the model hasn't sent anything. This is just the feed forward. So we're still here to do back propagation. So the second method I mentioned, which is um, how you can load your model, is by using this NN dot sequential. So this NN dot sequential, what it does is that um, it just passes everything you want to use into this particular function, your method. So initially, what you want to receive is our input size and then I want to see the layer size. So you just put NN dot linear here, passing your input, and then your next, what they call it, your next hidden layer input, which is the same thing as what we did, but it's just the values you are going to pass in here. So our input is 784, and now our hidden size, you need the zero index of it, which is this. So from 784 to 128 here, then we we'll apply our attribution function. This time around, this is like really what we're using. Then the next one, so the same thing. So you pass the same input, which is 128, and then the next one, which is 64. Then come back here, then 64, and then 10. So this one looks actually easier. You can use this sequential method, or you could use the other class method. So whichever one you want, both of them works. So it's still the same procedure, that kind of thing. So you can. Okay, this one you can check it out later, but if you notice here in when we're using the class method, you can assess each of those network by this. You can assess each of those network through these variables here. So if you do something like this, model dot f1, so you just print the exact one for that particular layer. So dot f2 will print just that particular layer. So that's because they are already named here. So you can assess each of them specifically through these names. But if you're using this sequential method now, if you notice it, these are index values. So if you want to do it, you do like model dot um, zero, model in square bracket zero, something like this. So you assess the same thing. So there's now another method you can use to give it exactly the name you want. So that's by using this other dig. So this other dig then takes it like this. So you pass it to pool. So you took the first part of it could be the name you want to give it and then its function. So it's still very, very similar to this. But this time around, they are adding your own custom names to it. Yeah. So that's how that works. Then that's for this part. I'm coming. Wait, do you want to call the break or should continue? <laughs> what do you say? I didn't hear. I think we should continue. Um, yeah, yeah, let's go on. Okay, but first of all, let me know how was this particular one if I keep up, if I continue. Feedback, feedback, feedback. I'm not saying like how how is it? Uh, uh, my check, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so uh, this part was pretty okay. Um, uh, you explained it well. Just to go back now and um, revise it to understand more. Um, what?
What's all about saying something now? Hello? I don't want to say something. Hello, did you get my point? Oh, yeah, I got you. I got you. Thanks. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay, so I think I'll just keep up. This thing is in the notebook, in the links for the shared. I don't know if you've seen this, but I separated them into different IPython notebooks. But apparently, it seems like I'll have to keep on using this notebook. Instead, we'll have to spend time downloading the data set again. Because to be sincere, we still have about six more notebooks to go through. And I don't know how feasible that would be, though. But let's just see how far we can go. So what I'll just be doing now is to be copying and pasting the code here in this same notebook we've used for the next ones. So I'm coming, let me just set it up. Oh, okay. Yeah, can you see the string? No. Can we see the string? Yes. Hello? Yes, I can. Okay, okay. Okay. So, so I'm just going to keep up with this notebook since we already have data sets here. So, sorry, I can't see the screen. Oh, what can you see? You, you blank, can black. They'll just give it a sign. Well, can anyone right. see what I'm showing now? Training neural networks? Yes, yes. Oh, I can okay. see it. Okay, okay. 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 You have to keep up with it now. Stanley, I want to ask. Okay, I'm, I'm, I can hear um, I don't. This last line I'm saying here, the okay? Wait, um, output exactly? feature, sorry. What does it mean? The, okay, after we printed, no, 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 just where you are. Okay, yeah, just above where you are now. The prints in bracket model dot FCI. Just, yeah, the last line right now. Oh, we're okay. having output features 128. And, oh. oh, you know, after um, building our model, you can mm -hmm. like just view a summary of what your model looks like like this by just the model. So in this case, you can see there are just three um, layers. We have the input layer here, the MIDI hidden layer, and then the output the layer. And then the output layer. Yes. So the thing is that these values mm -hmm. are ways to assess them. So basically, when you start like training neural networks and all, especially during transfer learning, there are some points where you need to like modify some specific layers of your okay. network. So you can modify the values, you can freeze them and some other things. But the whole point is that for you to modify most of these things, you need to have a way of assessing them. So that's, these are like the yeah, key. It's like a dictionary sort of, where this is the key and this is the value. You get, okay. so, so you can assess it by, you can assess a particular one by doing like model.fc1 will give you this value here to give you the information about this particular node or that particular mm -hmm. layer. Yeah, so okay. That, yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. I, I know 784 is the number of um, columns, right? And then yes. X is 64, right? If I'm not wrong. Yes, yes, yes how, did, right. how did 128 come in? Like, what does output? <laughs> features mean like is it the feature oh. that's going in I don't get like um, I don't is any way is anything okay so let me see um I don't know if there's anything okay I'll just try this guy out and so um imagine you have what do you call it now me I'm bad at really so okay just to get what you're saying again for example so 
you want to get how that 128 came about. Oh, I think I can write it in. So imagine you have um, 784 as our input. As our input column. Are you getting me? Yeah. Yes. So like I said, this one shouldn't matter. 64 by this 64 shouldn't really matter because we won't really need it. So if you have, if you have an input as something like this now, and then we want the next layer of our real network. Remember I said the real network is something like this. I don't have yes. to join everything, but- I know, I understand. Can, yes, so it can be reduced until you know, we get to our final one. So yeah. these are input layer, our middle layer, and that's our hidden layer, and then our output layer. Okay. So now this is our first input. Mm -hmm. When we're done with this, this becomes another input. Yes. Until we get to our final one there. Something, something. So the, that's just basically what is happening here. So this would be the shape of our next input. Okay, which would be like okay, this. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, so in order to achieve that now, like I said, mathematically, we have to use a width and um, width and matrix of 7, 8, 4 mm -hmm. by 128. So mm -hmm. if you do this, if you multiply this, you definitely have your next input. Uh, 64 be. by 128. Well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's So this time I'm not going to do all these mathematics. I'm not going to be passing the values itself. We want okay. to pass that. We want our first input to be this. Our output should be this. Okay. Then because this output will be the input to the next one, we then pass in 128 here and then 64 here. Okay, so we are the ones that will tell the system how many, um, what we want our output to be, as in what we want our second yes, layer. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Right? Okay, yes. okay. That's what's happening here. Now. Okay, I get it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, okay, so here you can, you can decide to use the sequential. So I'm just going to walk through the whole training process itself now. But the actual notebook, I'm going to share it where all of them are broken down into different notebooks. But this time, I'm not going to use everything in the same notebook because I don't want to download that data set from scratch again. So this is it now. So we want to, we are expecting our input, which is 784, like we already know. And we shall build a network of three layers and then pass 10 as our output. So now we already explained the feed forward part of it here. So this is the feed forward, where you pass in your data sets, you pass in your image into your model dot forward. So you are passing our image into our network. Then our network passes it, do those forward propagation, and then gives an output, which is the probability. This probability is because we use softmax. That's why we're having, that's why you can fit it for this one. So now we now want to do back propagation now. So which is now what we're going to talk about in this part. So now these are model uh, network. So if you remember, we spoke about um, cross entropy loss. We spoke about the maximum likelihood. From the maximum likelihood, we spoke about um, taking the log instead of multiplying them. So we can have addition instead of multiplication. So that's using log reading. Then from log reading, we spoke about getting negative values. So when you get negative, you know when you find the log of such, you have negative values. Log of a sigmoid function will give you negative values. Because one already, log one is zero. So anything less than one will give you negative values. So we then found negative log. So all those things are just things that helped build the cross entropy loss um, formula. So that's what I'm going to use here. So you can just call it as a function. It's still within the whole mathematics yourself. So by doing NN dot um, cross entropy loss, we are specifying the loss we are going to use to judge our um, model, our model output probabilities. So we can call this criterion. So I've defined our loss. So now we then repeat the same process we have been doing, which is the fault propagation. We take in our image, then flatten our image. This flattening is where this is 64. If you get so image dot shape will give you 64 by 784. So taking the image, no, not 784 initially, but 64 by 
4 by 28 by 28 by 1. Then if you pass it into our view, we want 64 to be here. Then the remaining should be left here. If we then, we then have 64 by, let me just put it in. Um, print images. So, oh no. So now we have 64 by 784. Then next is then this part. So when we pass our images into our model, it means we're passing it to our network. Then we'll have our logic. So if I print this logic, we, can, we should know what the shape of this logic should look like. So it should be 64 by um, 10. Print is what it does shape. If I do this now, uh, sorry. So this is, this is what we should get because from our model, this ought to be used. So we have 64 by 10, which are the logics. So now this then helps us, um, this criterion function is then our cross entropy loss function. So that's what we then use to know how bad our model is behaving. So we have our labels here, you pass in our labels, and passing the um, our model, what our model is bringing out, which is the logic this time around. So at this point, we, cannot, we are not going to use softmax because softmax can like it will affect it. So that's our amazing softmax here. So we are going to compare our model, um, the output of our model with the actual labels, so we can get the loss which we use for back propagation. So this is the loss here. So at this point now, we can then perform back propagation because we now have a loss, a loss function. You know, we already spoke about this loss function and how important it is when we are then working with gradient descent. So, okay. Then for this part now, this graph function here, we also just spoke about the whole gradient thing. So how PyTorch helps, how um, PyTorch keeps track of each part of our network. So for each layer of our neural nets now, as we keep for propagation on all, PyTorch stores the gradient for each variables or each of those weights. So that when we then get our file to our final output layer, we can then back propagate it using the gradients. So we can finally update it, we'll update those weights. So in the notebook, I explained the whole um, graph thing, but I'm just going to go straight to how it works. Comment. So, um, in comment. Sure. Mm. Yeah. So. Now, in order for us to then calculate the gradient, I don't know if you can remember the initial notebook from the second class, where we, if you then want to do the, the differential of, um, how would I put it down? Remember we explained this thing, I think I should draw it here. We said that when we have our error function, let's say our error function is E. So this would be the like error function. Then for us to then, do back propagation or do gradient descent, we have to then find the differential of the error function respect to our width, which are going to update, which would then be d e over whatever the width is. So we're going to be doing it for each of the widths. So but basically we're going to calculate the gradient of the error function which is of the width before updating them. So that's basically what's going to happen here. So when you see loss of backward, because this loss is at the top of, is at the top most of our um, neural nets, we're now going to back propagate using this. So this will now be calculating the gradient for each of the weights from this point. So that's what happens when you do this loss dot backward. So if I run this here, so if you can see, there was no gradient initially. And so, we um, initially we're just building the that's doing forward propagation. There was no width. 
what do I say? In Sharia, we're building the network. We are not back propagating up until this point. Then when you then call this loss of back code, it then calculates the gradient from this point to all the weights. So that's why you can see it here. Initially, there was no width for any of those, and there was no gradient for any of those weights that we've used initially. But when you call loss of back code, it then calculates the gradient for each of those weights, which is this here. Do we get, do we get what I'm saying? Because if you can remember, we explained that gradient thing in the second class, like how it works. Can't remember, or is anyone lost at this point? Because I see a lot of people are lost. Do we get what happened? What's happening here? Yeah, I'm lost too. I <laughs> <laughs> I don't get this backward forward propagation. Like theoretically, can you just explain like what it means? Maybe I can understand with the quotes. Like I don't know if you get my question. Okay, explain. Okay, okay. I so let me try and open that initial book we use. That's okay. from I think we two. Introduction to Python. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is the part I was talking about. So gradient with PyTorch generally. So this is it here. So if you have something like this now, touch dot one, so we created a variable like a. So if you then want to keep track of the gradient. For each of these values, so let's just call it a. Let me let me see if I can be storing it here. If you have um, a as the first variable, then a does require that means you want to set it to. Um, it means you want to like you probably find the whatever of this variable. You want to differentiate the particular variable with respect to this variable. You have to specify those required grad. But by default, PyTorch does it for images when you do the image. So you don't need to do this dot required grad again because it's always be true. So okay. yeah, so at this point now, um okay, no, no, not even E actually. This is why I started the example. So if you have X to be a tensor, which is four, and it required grad. So Z is now equals to X raised to power three. So I'll just um draw E here. Z is equals to is it Z or oh, yeah Z is equals to X raised power three something like this. So then if I say Z dot backward, we have look at it now. Z dot backward then means you want to differentiate, you want to find the Z over the X. Okay. So if you find the z over the um the z, you want to find if you find the z over the x, it means you want to have three x, x squared. Yeah, exactly. So if you notice x requires grad, you have to set it. Then when you then get to z, z dot backward then means it's more like saying you are writing the z. That what you just wrote here. Z dot backward. Then when you write x dot grad, it means you then want to find the z with respect to x. So that's what will be this output here. Do you get that? No. Okay. okay. Like what what does that just means is that look at we've written an equation here. You see, that's what we wrote. Z equals to x to the power three, which is exactly this here. That's what we wrote. So z equals to x to the power three. Yes. Yes, that was it is. So now z dot backward is like writing the z. That was it. I'm going to say that you want to find and you want to differentiate z. That's what it just means. But you've not specified what you want to differentiate z with. Okay. So okay. you then writing x dot grad then means I want to differentiate. You have already specified means you are specifying what you want to differentiate z with. Okay. Z over okay. the x. The x, okay. 
Yes. So like that's exactly what this means. So now if you come back here now, another thing to note is that for this thing to work, your what you are differentiating must be a scalar. It's very, very compulsory. So Z must be a scalar. So um where is it? This is equals to x raised power three. First ten. So but if you notice four, like this, this is just this is already a scalar though. But the point is that whatever you are going to be differentiating, which is your Z, uh, whatever you are doing those backward must be a scalar. So now if you come back here, if you notice we are working with tensors of 64 by this, whatever by this, but our loss specifically is a scalar. So okay. when you then do loss dot backward, it then means you want to find gradients. That's what it means. Let me come back to case I say tensor. Um, let's print. Okay, okay. Um, let's see. Okay. But the, yeah, this is what it's trying to say is. Okay. Say, okay, no, no, you cannot see it here. But basically, that's just this though. So, Z dot backward means you want to find the differential of the two respect to something. So, X dot grad then means you are finding this with respect to x. So it's actually the same thing that is happening here. So if you look at it now, um, at this point, model zero dot weight dot grad, if you notice it, it was none at this point. You can easily relate this to this place here. If I do x dot grad, initially if I do z dot backward, print x dot grad, you can see the same none because I've not specified my this I don't specify what I want to differentiate. That's why to give you none. So that is actually what's happening here. We want to update our width, but initially it was just forward propagation. Forward propagation does not have anything to do with updating width. It's just use initial width. Specify that we are going to use that it's required grad. Remember I said it here. Okay. Yeah. So so like what I'm saying is that Python automatically helps us put this required grad, so we don't have to do it manually. So at this point, we're not updating with for forward propagation, but for back propagation, the first thing is to then find the um, find the gradient. So which is this loss of backward. So that's what it helps us do. Like, do we get this part now? Yeah, I think. Okay, okay, okay. No problem. So now what what will happen now is that after this, we've then gotten the gradient for each of our weights. So if you can look at this now, you see that we've gotten the differential that's the derivative of all our weights. So now that we've done that now, the next thing to then do is to then um, specify our optimizer. So you know gradient descent is what uses this thing too. You can then use gradient descent optimizer. So it's still a function in PyTorch. So what you just need to do, I'm coming, let me just make this for now. What you just need to do is you just pass the, um, okay, sorry. Let me just run this thing from start. Let's see what's, okay. So now this will not be our optimizer. So I'm going to be using Stochastic Gradient Descent Optimizer. So what you just need to do next is to just import the optimizer function from PyTorch and then specify the particular one you're using. So there are many times, if you check the documentation, you see many one, uh, many optimizers, there's Adam, Adam's optimizer, there's Adam mode, there's Stochastic Gradient Descent. Although in most cases, Adam's perform better than Stochastic Gradient Descent, but for this one, I just need to use Stochastic Gradient Descent Optimizer. So, this is just all specifying an optimizer. If I print optimizer, yeah. So this this is just a multi contains. So 
what makes for us to do now is to um there's now what you call optimizer to expect. So now what this does now is to then update our weight. So you remember what you just did in the last stage was to just get the derivatives. So now after getting those derivatives, we then want to use gradient descent, which is the stochastic gradient descent to then update the weight. So even if you if you check the that second class notebook, the part of the files, how it works, that's just from scratch. The whole with updating, but this time around, they're just going to be using functions to so, optimize that or step update the width. So, if you if I print it now, sorry, let me get the code for it. If I print the width now, you see that it's different. Um, okay, I didn't print the width initially. Sorry, instead of printing the drag, I'll just let me print it before I updated it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So this is the initial weight here of model one. So then after applying applying this optimizer to step, you notice that huh? so upon this let me see. Um sorry I'm coming. Oh I think I know. Okay, that leads to the next issue now. There's one thing that is important. Yeah, but I was still going to mention it. So there's one thing that we need to know is that when training for each epoch now, remember if you notice I've, I ran this code multiple times. So one thing that Python does is that it stores the gradient. So if you if you run it again, the previous gradient will still be there. So it's kind of mess it up. So whenever I'm going to be iterating by epoch, what I just did now is just a single epoch. So I'll still do like a full compilation. So I'll be repeating the, exactly the same gradients I used initially. So there's something, I think I'll add it to somewhere like here. Yeah, yeah. So what this does now is that it sets the gradient back to zero. So that's what this thing does. Maybe that's why I was getting those repeated values. Let me let me try it now. That was it. Yeah. So you guess now. So what happened is that whenever we store those gradients and we run, it seems like there are too many codes here. But whenever you store those gradients and you run it, if you come back again in the next report and you don't clear that gradient, it use the previous one and then you're getting the same values. So you always have to set this thing here. It's optimized to zero grad. So that's what helps you clear the gradient and then use for the next one, not the initial gradient. So that's just basically how it works. So at this point, the weights have been updated, but that's just for a single image that I've been working with. So I'll just copy and paste this code now for a full training process now. I'll copy it now too. So, um, okay, so now we have to, first of all, like I've said, I'm not explain. First of all, you define our model network, which is this. We already understand how this one works. Um, I won't use this, I'll just use first. I'll, explain, I'll come back to explain this one. I'll just use. And then dot um percent should be lost. I think it's calculator here. Yeah. So so first of all you declare our module, which is here. Sorry. So first of all, we declare a model, which is this. The next thing for us to do is to then specify our loss function. So we're using cross entropy loss function here. We we'll specify it, and after specifying this, we then specify our optimizer. So our optimizer is this um, stochastic gradient descent. Then we we'll pass our model those parameters. So these are just the model parameters we're passing into this. Then you can specify the learning rate. Then if you check, I show you some other things you can change in your optimizer. 
things like you can specify the um some, yeah you can specify the momentum and some other things so these are other variables you can change optimizer but by default range rate is 0 0.01 so you can specify all that things there you can modify it then now i'm going to i trade for five epochs so you are going to do this more knowledge so you then specify for e in range epoch so you're going to iterate five times you then do for images and label in train loader so like i said your train loader routine and returns two variables which is your images and your label but you're going to return in batches so like i specified already it was 64 batches so now for the first 64 images now i'm going to flatten my image so I'll write images dot view this is going to be 64 and then this would be 784 so now i have my images flattened you have to specify this one that like i said that's very important if not you'll be having repeating gradients like we experienced initially so specify optimizer to zero grad then this clears the gradient then next thing is then pass our images into our network so which is default propagation so model dot forward then pass in our images so our images will go through this whole network process and then return 10 um, neurons as our output for the, each of the 64 images. Then once you get our output, you can then compare to get our loss function. So we're using um, this cross entropy loss function. So we're passing our labels and the output of our model. So that's where the whole comparison will be done and they return a particular loss. So when we've gotten our loss, we then do loss.backward. Loss.backward helps us calculate the gradient for each of the weights respect to that particular loss so the loss is a function like i said is this e okay i already removed it but the loss function is like our error so now we've gotten it we then optimize it so optimizer the step is then what applies our optimizer in this case it is total and stochastic gradient descent so this then is what is what does the weight update so once we've done the weight update you can then calculate our um, print at this point, what's happening is um, you keep getting the loss. Then here is calculating the training loss. So you can still calculate the error too, or the accuracy. But we'll still talk about that one later. So this is just the full training process for five epochs. We notice that the loss is given. So you don't have any question at all to ask. Does anyone have any question or any confusion? So, hello, Stanley. Okay. Um, um, is there like a minimum loss we are meant to get when after training? A minimum loss? Or it can be, yes. Mm. Okay, I mean, I'm then I'm actually, point, training loss 1.65. So I want to know if, if, if it can be lower or maybe there's like a range that is acceptable. Yeah, it can be lower. Okay, yes, yeah, so I'll explain. That's just exactly after this part. So I will understand how this thing works. So there is this technique they use, which is called a list topping. So I will still talk about each of those ones. So there will be a point where um, you loss. So when it gets to the minimum, there's a point where it can even start increasing. But just feel our experience, our experience. Let me just display this. So if you notice now, let me see this is just for five epochs. Let me increase it to 10. That also happens to the loss. The training loss specifically. So while that one is running, so you can then test it now to see how well your model is moving. So this is just me loading my test images. So um, if I print this, um, print images. so I'm printing images from my train, although it's having better idea of the test too, but images dot shape. You, you notice that the loss reduces when I increase the number of reports. Okay, so 
This is me loading just a single batch of the image now. So I'm going to use this one for testing purpose. Even though I'm testing on the training set, which shouldn't be so, because definitely to get it because it was part of the training data. So when you pass it, so this is after a whole training process, just to see that your model works. So what you have to do first of all is to flatten it. Like I said, so flattening is very important. One by seven. So this is just getting a single image from it. Getting a single image from your data set. So I'm going to use this one as just a test. So which touch dot no grad. So this time around, what you just what this means now is that you want to turn off the gradient. So it won't calculate any you want to, you know, um if you look at that notebook I explained here. So you know, if you notice when you say require grad equals to true. So this helps us keep track of the gradient for each variable, for each of those weights. But here, when you specify no grad, it means that you don't want to use the gradient at all because we're testing, we're not training. So it's only we're training that we can turn on the gradient. But this time around, even if you leave it on, it will still work, but it's just that it becomes slower. Your inference period of inference time will be slower. So that's how we turn it off. Then we pass our image into the model. Because this model is already trained, it should give us a, um, how I call it, a reliable output. Which is our logic. So now we can then apply soft max to it. So when you apply soft max to it, you get the actual prediction. So if I run this now, you can see it. So this is our model predicting that it's the one, and it's actually one. But the thing is that, like I said, this is still training loader, so it's almost, it's almost like 100% certain that you get it because it was part of the training set. Like I said. Um, so did you train? Did you train just uh, one batch of the um, uh, image data? No, 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 it's not just one batch. That this is me training the whole this thing. What I said is that for a particular batch, there are going to be sixty-four images. But that does not mean you're only going to be training on sixty-four images. It just means that it should just take sixty-four images from your full data set for training. So it's going to be picking them randomly, not a just not just one particular sixty four images. Do you get? Uh, sorry, can you explain that again? I didn't really understand. Okay, this is what I'm saying here. Um, shit. So look at this now. We have our training loader. The way the training loader is designed is that it should be releasing 64 of your full data set images for training okay. for just a particular epoch. So for this single, for this first epoch now, it's released 64 images. The next one again, it's released 64. So you're going to be iterating through each of them. This full epoch is going to go through everything. It's going to go through all your um, data sets for this particular epoch. But what this does now, what this second for loop is for, is that it's going to be iterating through 64. It's going to be taking 64 images at a particular time. Like, do you get? Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand now. Okay, let me try and say it again. So, number of epoch is how many times it should go through your full data set. Then, this second one is just you going through 64 images of your data set at a point. So it's going to okay. still go through your full data set, but it's not going through all of them at the same time because it's be much more slower okay. and harder to take everything at the same time. So that's why it's going to break it down into batches. Okay, all right, that's fine. Yeah, yeah it's just like saying, let's just say in a secondary school. So let's just say you have about 1,000 students that want to write an exam in a classroom of 64. So, Everyone is going to write that same exam, but the whole point is that you'll be taking 64 students at the time. Okay, okay, yeah, clear now. Okay, yeah, so that's just it. So that's the whole training process, and this is the inference. So now, to the next thing I said I wanted to explain now, it's in this free Udacity course that study posted. So it's just introduction to PyTorch. On his own, but I'm just going to like talk about some of those things, some important things that we need to know when training in your network. So, 
first one I'll talk about is this overfitting and underfitting. Um, okay, even if, sorry, let me just see if I can. So this would then lead to the question that um, someone asks to know the best clause, something like that. So when you're training, it's best to, okay, so I'm just going to put a particular image. Ah, is it possible that diagram I'm looking for? Okay, yeah, I think it's going to be here. Mm -hmm, yeah, so this is what we were saying. So to know the best loss, it's not like you can actually know the exact best loss, but there is this model complexity graph. So what it helps us do is that, first of all, we're going to split our data sets into two screen and, test and validation. So your training data is going to be what you're going to use to be training. And your validation data is what you're going to be validating for every time you are training. So for a particular epoch, you have your training, you do your training, and you also do your testing. So after training, you test to see how well it's performing on another section of that data set that you didn't use for training. So if you can see it now, this is like the training. This um, orange one is the training, then this purple one with stripes is your testing data set. So we initially at the starting point now, both of them, both your training and your testing error will be quite high actually. So both of them will be high initially at this point, something like this. So there's last way you like talk about overfitting and rather underfitting because your model has not been trained well to understand how things work or how to get each of those things. So now as you keep training through each of the epoch, what this helps you do now, what this graph helps you do is that it helps you um, check the relationship between your training error and your testing error. So your training error, if you look at that one that we did here, um, sorry, yeah, you can, this is just our training loss here that was just reducing, this is our training loss. But we're going to keep track of both training and test and validation or testing when working with real um, data sets this time around. So as you keep training, you'll be checking the loss. You'll be comparing the loss of the training one with the testing loss. So if you look at it now, when, uh, if you notice both here and here, you're actually moving together and reducing, and reducing and reducing up until this point. So this is more like the best point it can ever be. So your loss can be, um, if you look at this thing now, your training loss can be at this point. Imagine if you had a test um, loss also, let's just be written on this part of our code here. And at a point, you notice that your training loss was still reducing and your test loss was increasing. Then it means something wrong is happening, which is what is then happening after this point. So this is like the right position. Then you then see that your training loss start reducing too. You see, like it keeps on reducing, but your test loss starts increasing. Then you are then overfitting. So overfitting then means your model is becoming too complex and putting things. Um, how does it? Is? Like your model is actually just cramming, memorizing your data sets. It's no more learning again. It's memorizing your data sets. So that's where the overfitting kicks in. But you be deceived. So for instance, in this case now. If I increase the epoch to like 100, or let's just say something more like this now, if I create something like this, it's a tick. Oh, what did I just do? Uh, like I printed something, I was supposed to print. Hmm. Sorry. If I increase this now, if I, what I'm saying is that if I increase my my training, if I increase my number of reports now, you feel like your model is doing well because your training loss is reducing. But that's the whole point of your test loss because it makes you know when your model is not actually learning, when instead it's cramming your training data. Then this test, because it has not seen it before, you can then use this for the true test to actually know whether your model is actually learning or cramming. Then it starts to be different between both of them. So 
Now, to then know your exact best points to stop or to know your best um, dots, you then use this early stopping technique. It's available on PyTorch too. So, what this early stopping algorithm does is that once it realizes that your training loss is going down but your test loss is increasing, it will just stop it. So, even if I put like 30 epochs now, and as of the seventh epoch, it becomes a um, deviation between your training loss and your test loss. It's break at that point. It's just stop working at that point. So you can see like it, it's still reducing, but who knows already? It might have started overfitting somewhere, but in our head is reducing. That kind of thing. Do we get? Like, is it clear? Is this unclear? Pause. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's clear. Okay. So um let me open the next one. I'm not sure if we sorry. Maybe there's anything there that we need that is oh <laughs> We well, should study already explain this part before. So what? Yes, it did. Um, okay, it's okay. not bad you're explaining again. Okay. It's clear. Yeah. Do we know about regularization? Regularization. Drop um but let us just look at this one. If there's anyone that we don't know about. Let me try and explain because uh, regularization is important, dropouts are important, and um, random stats are important. By changing the descent, I already explained this one. Then, batch versus stochastic gradient descent. If there's anyone that would understand, you can talk about it. Okay. Okay, let me just assume that it's clear. So, um, So the next one, I'm, what I'm going to do now next is to, oh, this is my, I don't think I will have to, because of time, let me just see, sure. but I don't know if I'll be able to download the data set. I'm coming. Um. So I'll be back soon, I'm coming. Let me just Okay. Wow. Okay, seems like this. So I bet you can know where the issue was. Why that thing was slow? Okay, okay. We're coming. Yeah, so in this particular notebook now, I'm just can you see this classifying fashion in this? Can we see this one? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, okay, so I think this will be the last one for today that we can leave. So, so initially what worked with was just a single, um, okay, I'm not sure this one is, sorry. Okay. Okay, this fashion image is still, it still is a um, single channel image though. But at this point, what I'm going to then do, the difference between this and what we've done is that and now we need to separate our data set into train and test. So we can then compute, we can then do that stuff that I mentioned. So it's best to know your training loss and to also know your test loss so you can know when to stop. That kind of thing. So first thing to do is to um, specify your transforms. I say it's an initial uh, notebook. So you create these transforms. First of all, I want to convert my images to tensors. Then after converting to tensors, I want to normalize them. 
So this is the function for normalization. So like I said, um, Python provides some free data sets. So what you just need to do is to import data set and then data set dot fashion image. So this is where I want to save it here. That's what just that's what this one is. We want to save it then specify, download through, then train through, and then put your transforms. Then for the train loader, what you just need to do is to then add your train sets into PyTorch data loader. So like I said, PyTorch data loader puts your data set in batches. So in this case, batch size of 64. But I'll just use 32. You can use 32 actually, whichever batch size you want to use. So then for the test loader too, this time around the set training equals to false, and that only goes to true. So that's it. So it's also good to shuffle though. So that's just losing our image. So um, with this, you can just use a simple image of what, um, a simple example of what the image looks like here. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry. I don't know why this helper function isn't working. Okay. Right. Sure. Sorry. So, I'm wondering why this helper does pricing is working. Was it? Fast with this one. So this is an example of what the image looks like here. So this is just um, what to define. So as in NN, we just import some of those PyTorch functions. So optim for optimizer, this for neural network architecture, then functional for those functions like sigmoid function, relu and the rest. So that's just important the libraries we need. So we can then design our network. So like I said, we always have to be sure that our image dimension is, is what work in, is the initial thing we're setting for our network. So let's print image dot shape here. So we can see, it's, and remember I specified the batch size to be 32. So it means we'll be loading test images per batch. Then it's 28 by 28, still 28 by 28. So it means our network would be in Sharia 784. So um, this is what it should look like. 784, then the output should be 256. 
then from 256 to 128, from 128 to 61, from 64 to 10. So you can do it anyhow you want to do it. You can make it larger, you can make it smaller. So it just depends on what you want. So then another thing that um, they did is that, you remember in the last clone, our criteria was just um, cross entropy. But if you remember when I was proving the whole cross entropy formula, the first step we had to do was to first find log source max. So, you know, um, maximum likelihood is just basically the multiplication of each of the probabilities. So, multiplication of the source max values. So, I mentioned that we didn't want to use multiplication because of how multiplication values increase. It's just a small increase in any of those variables can change the output. So, we wanted to use addition instead. So, we then found logarithm. So, logarithm automatically converts at the end multiplication to addition. So, after finding the log value, which is exactly this here. This is basically it here. Then to then find the cross entropy formula itself, we then found negative log of it. So which is this here. So this is just negative um, log likelihood, or rather negative likelihood loss. Yeah. So that's just it. So if you check the Python documentation, whichever one you want to use would work. If you're using NN loss, this NN loss, it means you are going to add this one as part of your network. But if you're using the cross entropy loss itself, you don't need it because cross entropy loss consists of both of these two here. Cross entropy loss consists of these two variables already. So whichever one you want to use, it work. So it's still the same process we're going to use. We're going to draw our criterion, set our criterion, then our optimizer to, in this case, remember I mentioned Adam optimizer. So I'm using Adam Optimizer this time around instead of stochastic gradient descent optimizer. So now we're going to build, we're going to um, go to 10 epoches. So like I said, the first thing is to go through each batch of your image. So for each epoch now, the first thing is to iterate through the first batch. So even though I'm going to iterate through all the batches, so I'm just going to use one to explain it. So for the first batch now, we load the images and data sets from the train loader. Then we we'll flatten our image. Like I said, it's very important for us to flatten it. Then after flattening it, we then pass it into our um, model, our model network. So we pass our image and then get our output. So our output will then be the logic, which we then compare with our labels. So using our criterion, which is our loss function. So after comparing it, we get a loss. So that loss is like the difference between the actual values, actual class values, and the predicted values from our model. So now we've got our loss function. We then want to, um, there's something that is missing here, but I don't know if anyone will remember and tell me. So what I said is, okay, okay, no, no, it's not actually, they put it here this time around. So is this optimized as a regard? Like I said, this is very, very important. It's not just the waste of time. So we have to clear our gradient. Then after clean our gradient, we then want to find the new gradient, which is this, for our current weight values. So when we do loss of backward, we want to then calculate the gradient for each of the weights we've used throughout the network or for propagation. So after getting the derivatives, we then can then use those derivatives to then perform our optimization step here. So when we find our optimization step, we're now updating the weights now. So we now have a new weight. So this running loss variable is going to have the current running loss. So it's going to be the, um, uh, what do you call it? It's just like adding the, the total loss, basically. But it's just for, what do you call it? It's for, for fraction purpose in this case here. I'm just going to use it to like not watch any loss. So this is just the training process here that we explained. So we can then train it. So training loss is just the running loss all over the total number of images we have in our data set. Uh, it is going to take quite a lot of time, so I'll just be getting the training. But if you notice, this one will be better because why didn't add? Adams optimizer. Adams optimizer is far better than stochastic gradient descent in terms of performance. Though. 
So then the next one now is for us to then do our um, test. So this is just it here. So first of all, we load from our test loader. So this is on image it has not seen this time around. If you remember when we were testing initially, we were testing on the training sets of which we knew that definitely was going to perform well because you already know it. So we just load a single image from our image um, data, from our image data and our test data set. So this is it here. So you load a single image, then resize it, convert it to one by 784 because we're just using a single image to test. Then we remove the gradient because we're not going to use it for testing purposes. Then get our model prediction, which is here. So when we then get our model prediction, so these are just logic values. So like I said, these are just probabilities. Then to then get the probability for each of those class is for you to then apply softmax to it, which is then this f the softmax. So remember, f is this our function here. F is from here. Um, yeah, those so just n n dot function as f. So f contains most of those functions like sigmoid function, ReLU, um, softmax. So we're going to get the softmax outputs of it. So the more means we're going to get softmax across columns. So each column we're going to get the softmax for each of them. So then we then print the probabilities. So if you check this probability to sum up to one, all these values to sum up to one. But the one, the class with the highest probability is probably definitely its prediction. The one that will get the highest probability. So Okay, it is almost done. Again. So it's three, four, five, six. Okay, it's almost done training. So we'll just go and test it. Okay. Um, same as that one, so three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's like two more for it to be done. So, um, alternatively, you could use this, our other method, but it seems like the sequential method is easier, even though I prefer to use this one though. So it's still the same procedure. You can check it out when, when you have the node root. So it's just, the only difference is just the mode of declaring the network, then the remaining thing is the same. Remaining at the same, the same process. We still get the same thing. So, okay, let me see. Is it okay? It's done. So if you check here now, uh, I hope it's not the same place. Yeah. So these, these are the predictions now for each of them. I need to bank anyone. Okay, because it's on. We can test it as much, much as we want. So the model is actually doing well, because this is on the data set it has not seen, which is in test loader. So apparently, it seems that these are going to stop. But I want to just load something that we'll see. Sorry. Uh, something I'm looking for. Sorry. Okay. Then, um, so perfect. Eight, four. Yeah. So, like, I'm going to give out all these materials that we've gone through. So that you can just go through it through practice and all. But what I'm going to then do is that I'm going to release a particular um, data set. As the name is aliens versus predictor images. So it's one alien versus predictor. I'll try and open it so I will see the, what the data set looks like. So we are just going to implement what we've done on that particular data set. The main difference is that, um, okay, okay, I'll, I'll make it easier. Because what we, the only type of images we've used are the Python's default images. But this time around, I'm going to load in our own custom images. That's what I'm going to work with. So I'll just like add 
I'll just add part of the code here in this little detail so you can see it. But the remaining is the same. So you can build your own network and then perform your test on it. Is that fine? It's quite easy. So maybe. Hello. I was wondering something. Um, I'm coming. Yeah, so this is what the data set looks like. So this is the train side and this is the validation already. So it's just the two class system. We're just going to compare aliens and predictors. So these are images of aliens here. So, and then these are images of predictors. So what we're just going to do is to just go through the same process we've done which is um, import our libraries, important libraries are going to use, load the data sets, then build our model architecture. So it's not compulsory to use this exact model architecture that I use. You can use any amount you want. You can use, if like just 50 um, layers, you can use 50 layers, but make sure there's no overfit. You can use 50 layers for setting up our model. Then we'll do our training. Actually, I wanted us to do the inference part and validation part, but because of time, you can't do it. So you just do module training and then do a simple validation on it. So I'll just like try and put things a bit in order so it's easier for us to work with. Is that fine? And yeah, um, how, how do we fine. get the data set to aliens and predators? Yeah, I'm going to say this, everything. It's not large, actually. The data set is not that large. It's something you can okay. download. Yeah, so this right. is a zip file. So it's 7 MB. Oh, 7 MB. Okay. Mm. So, do you have any lesson? Or is there any question or contribution or anything? Um, I have a question. Uh, it's not uh, really related to this class. I think it's from the previous class. I, I don't okay. really understand the con I don't really understand the concept of um maximum likelihood with the cross entropy laws. It, it's a bit fuzzy to me. Oh. Um okay. I don't know if anyone else wants to well is everyone fine if you go to it. Let me I think it's in this is in one of those notebooks that we use do. I'm coming. Let me see. There's this notebook where Where I explained it, introductions by touch. I'm coming. Yeah. So, can can we all see this introductions by touch then? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I was not the first one to call our time. Even though I didn't know, it's quite explanatory here. Though. But I'll just try and see if I can see anything. Uh, yeah, so this was the part I was explaining this here. Okay. Where, yeah, so this was the maximum likelihood thing. So how it works is that if you have um if you have like a data set now, so this uh, this part is for the blue side and this part is for the red side. So if he sees a red now, you know, if you look at it now, he expects blue balls to be in the blue colored side and red balls to be in the red colored side. So if you see a red colored yeah. thing in the blue colored side, uh, it means that your model um, banged it, that kind of thing. So it takes 0 0.1 here. It takes 0 0.1 here. So okay. what, why, it's called, why, why it's called maximum likelihood is that you want to multiply the pro all the probabilities together. So the higher the probability, the better your maximum likelihood. The higher the probability, the better your maximum likelihood and more accurate your model is. So here, it predicted a red ball. It called the red ball blue ball. But meanwhile, it is red. So its rating of value will be 0 0.1. So you know 0 0.1 is very low compared to 0 0.9. That's because we failed it. Yeah. So you take 0 0.1 here, 
then here he actually got it as a blue ball, but it's um and probability is 0 0.6. So it is 0 0.1 times 0 0.6. Then at this point now, it's called a red ball, a red ball. So this is the red area, so it got it, so it's 0 0.7. So you have 0 0.1 times 0 0.6 times 0 0.7. Then here, okay. And here we have um, a blue ball in a red ball, in a red place. So it, it's saying the probability of it being um, so what, what in this part here is going to take the probability of it being blue, which is 0 0.2, because the rating is bad. So it actually filled it, so it's going to take it. So if you look at it now, this is what it's going to be here. 0 0.6 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.1 times 0 0.7, which is 0 0.0084. But if you look at this one now, it actually got everything correct here. So he said this one was a red ball in a red space. Red ball in your red space, blue ball in your blue space, blue ball in your blue space. So if you multiply all these things, you'll be getting 0 0.3. Oh, all right. Yeah, so now what I was saying, what I was talking about was that if you use this method now, just a simple change, like if I change the 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, it will affect this value so bad. It will affect this output so bad. So a better way to do it is to try and convert this multiplication to addition. So sorry, I you said if we do, do I, sorry, you broke a bit. I didn't hear you. Oh, I said that if you if you change any value here, if you change yes. any value here, it will affect the output badly. So a better way to do it is to try and convert this modification to addition because addition just causes little change when there's a little change in the input. It causes little change in the output when there's little change in the input. Do you get? Yeah. So that's why you can then use log. I converted everything to log. So finding the log of each of these outputs or these variables, then make such as addition instead, which is better for us. Okay. Yeah, so that's why I then spoke about having negative log likelihood. So when you find the log of it, log always gives you negative value. So your output will definitely be a negative value. So for cross entropy loss, yeah. because of that, I said log reading gives us negative value by default. For any value less than one, it gives a negative value. But we don't want our output to be a negative value. So in order to do that, we change this to negative, negative log reading, which is what I did here. So when you then find negative log reading of any of them, it to give it the positive value. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah, so this will now be our loss. This would be our cross entropy loss. So that's what I was trying to say. My yeah. cross entropy loss, you mean? You mean what? What are you saying? My cross entropy loss, I mean what? Okay, that's the formula you use to calculate the, the loss of the. Yeah, this formula helps us achieve this thing easier. That's what it does. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. So yeah, you can just go through this particular notebook. It's one for week two. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Juan. I'll, I'll do that. Thanks. Okay. So so does anyone have any other question or any concern at all? Nothing from here. Okay, okay. Okay, since nothing then, um, all right then everyone. Yeah. Sorry it was this long, but well, I, hope, I hope it was okay. And I think if we go through the notebook, it will be easier for us to understand. Then if you yeah. have any issues, you can message me on Slack or post it on the deep learning. Um, so, so how do you get access to the notebook? And I saw that this, video, this call was recorded. Do we have access to the video too? Um, okay, I'm not trying to say that it's being recorded now, but I'll ask, I'll ask them, I'll ask like Kinichi or Teji or anyone. Oh. Okay, so we can use it to go through the notebook again. Yeah, sure. No problem. Thanks. Yeah. All right, everyone, then. Have a lovely weekend. You too. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, all right. yeah thanks.